it's an exciting time in astronomy now. We've got JWST finally operational, taking us farther out into the universe than we've ever seen before and revealing newly forming planets and new galaxies coming together at the edge of the universe. And there's a lot of science, a lot of claims, a lot of stuff that's being sort of bandied around. And it's tricky to be able to look through that stuff and be able to make sense of it and sort of get a much better, more honest, realistic take about where we stand in our understanding of the cosmos, especially when it relates to some of the biggest questions about dark matter, dark energy, antimatter, matter, um, inflation. And one of my favorite writers, science communicators on this topic is Dr. Ethan Siegel. He's a theorist, but is really a full time writer who produces an amazing blog over at Big Think about all things cosmology and particle physics and science communication. And when I have the toughest questions, I reach out to him to help me understand the answers and has been sort of an, an unofficial mentor for me, mostly when he critiques us doing uh, making a mistake and needing a little correction. And he's been always quite gracious, but firm when he thinks we've got it wrong at universe today. So uh, I got a chance to sit down with Ethan and chat just like in general about where we stand in new discoveries and the results that are coming back from JWST and what comes next and how we balance between being a theorist and an experimenter and what our role is as science communicators and as people who want to appreciate and understand science. So if any of that stuff sounds fun to you, I think you'll really enjoy this conversation with Dr. Ethan Siegel. All right, here's the interview. Ethan, it's good to see you again. Frazier, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back after what seems like an unfortunately long time. It's almost like something happened during the last three years that just puts a fog on things, but I'm so happy to be back. The universe, the universe thankfully hasn't gone anywhere. Right, yeah. Um, but a lot of really interesting things have have happened in the universe and and no kidding. <laughs> and I wanted to so so like I do a question show every week here on the channel where I try to answer people's questions, but you're one of the people. There's a sort of few mentors in my life that I reach out to when the questions get beyond me, and you are absolutely one of those people who you've really influenced my my thinking and my methods as a science communicator. So so thank you in advance. Um, and now I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> right. Thank you. This is this is a very flattering intro, but it also reminds me of a conversation I saw with a former police officer who was scared out uh, walking at night uh, with his dog and he brought his gun. And afterwards he was like, no, I was still scared. I should have brought the big gun. So thank you for letting me know with this preface that you are bringing the big gun in and here are right. some big gun questions coming yeah. my way. So first, I'm obsessed about the crisis in cosmology and just, you know, the Hubble tension, the um, the and and I think from my perspective, you know, the name is bad because people think it's a bad thing that there are these two measurements at, the, at, at different ages, you know, trying to measure the expansion rate of the universe and they don't agree and their error bars don't overlap. And this is like finally cosmologists, all of their you know, their careful construction starting to break down. Uh, but I think it's exciting. Well, this is this is part of what we live for, right? Are these big puzzles where we say, okay, like we have this whole standard model of cosmology, which has been around for at least a couple of decades now, where we say, look, the normal matter and the photons, the radiation, and all the stuff that you make in the standard model is there. And it's there just like you'd expect. But there are a few things that are also there that are maybe a little new to some people. For example, the, the laws of physics that we know uh, are pretty symmetric between matter and antimatter. But for some reason, the universe isn't. Our observable universe is almost exclusively made out of normal matter with nary a trace of antimatter. Why? We don't know, big outstanding problem. We also know that the normal stuff in the universe, mostly stuff made out of standard model particles like photons and neutrinos and also protons, neutrons and electrons, um, 
that's only about 5% of the total stuff out there in the universe. Dark matter and dark energy exist. And why are they there? And what's the cause of them? And nobody knows. Oh, and also, by the way, the Big Bang isn't the beginning of the universe anymore. The Big Bang starts like chapter two in the story of our universe. There's this whole phase of cosmic inflation that happened before it. So all of that, the inflationary hot Big Bang with dark energy and dark matter is our consensus cosmology. We call that the Lambda CDM, where Lambda is dark energy and CDM is cold dark matter. That's our universe. The thing about this Hubble tension, or what people are calling the Hubble tension, is there are a couple of fundamentally different ways you can measure how fast is the universe expanding. Uh, you can look at individual objects at a variety of distances, and it doesn't matter what those objects are, they all kind of converge and give you the same answer. And then you can also look at, well, what if there was an early relic imprinted in the early stages of the hot Big Bang? Something like uh, the peaks, the temperature peaks and valleys in the CMB, in the cosmic microwave background, or the clustering imprinted in galaxies, that clustering pattern imprinted in the patterns of galaxies we see called baryon acoustic oscillations. If we use those methods, we also get the same answer every time. But just like you said, the distance ladder methods and the early relic methods give two different answers that don't agree. In fact, this has been something where there has been a growing tension for, I'd say, about the last 15 years. And recently, I'd say really only in the last four or five years, people have started taking it really seriously and said, you know, we really beat down the error bars and we removed all the sources of uncertainty and we checked better and better. And for some reason, with the early relic method, we get an answer that's about 9% lower than the distance ladder method. And that tiny difference, you know, when each of these measurements only have an uncertainty of one or 2%, you're really pushing the envelope to its limit when you're like, well, maybe they'll meet in the middle. Maybe they'll be somewhere here around 70 or 71 and, and you'll get everything to converge. It doesn't look like it's doing that. That's a big puzzle. That's an interesting thing to consider. And the truth is, if the observations continue to hold up, if all of the early relic methods give one answer and all of the distance ladder methods continue to give another answer, we're going to have to figure out this puzzle. It could be a sign of new physics somewhere in the universe. But I want to talk about this, this idea that you were talking about today on your blog. And by the way, you've got a fantastic blog at, at, uh, at Big Think. I, I really enjoy it. Um, about this idea of like clues, cracks, and a crisis. So, right. So it's real easy, right? It's real easy. If you want to get attention, right? You know, you, you light a little match and you scream fire. That's attention, right? You, you make something seem like the biggest thing in the world. And that's how you get attention to it. A lot of people have been claiming there's a crisis in cosmology, and they point to not only this Hubble tension, which is, you know, it has finally crossed that gold standard, that five sigma statistical significance standard for us to say, hey, something really interesting is happening here. We should take a look. But then people say, well, it's not just that, and that's something I called a crack in the theory, where, you know, we have something that's really robust, it's held up over time, we've scrutinized it, we've looked for sources of error, we have very good data, and we don't know how to explain what's going on. I would say that's a crack in the standard model of cosmology, and cracks are great, because that's how the light gets in, and sometimes that's your window into there is something new to discover. But what a lot of people have been doing has been saying, oh, well, I'm not just going to take this crack. I'm going to take all these other discrepancies that I can find wherever I could find them. And even though I would say they're really only just clues at this point, they're really only, you know, 
they haven't reached that five sigma standard. They haven't gotten to the point where everyone who measures it gets the same outcome. They haven't gotten to the point where this has been a long standing problem for a long time and there's no clear resolution and you, you can't chalk it up to statistical uncertainty or cosmic variance or any of these other, you know, oh, maybe it's just an error. Um, you know, you have people taking these more spurious pieces of evidence and saying, oh, well, look at this and this and this and this and this and this, plus the Hubble tension, and now we have a crisis. And I think that's disingenuous because to me, the most remarkable thing about Lambda CDM cosmology is how spectacularly well it works for pretty much everything. Like, what, what I see happening is people saying, oh, well, if I exaggerate how important this is and I don't look at the mainstream evidence for this, but only at this other evidence for this part, then I can say, oh, well, maybe individual galaxies are doing something surprising. So maybe something's wrong with dark matter. And maybe uh, the way that binary stars are moving with respect to each other, people argue over that. So maybe that's a crack. And maybe the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background look a little different on these angular scales than these angular scales. And, and, and that shouldn't be. So maybe that's a... And what they're doing is they're taking all of this dubious evidence, throwing it together into like a Vitamix and blending them up and pouring it out and saying, hey, Look at this crisis. And I'm like, the only crisis that's going on here is how badly you've exaggerated what's actually true. We do have one real what I'll call a crack in the standard model in the form of this Hubble tension. We do have other clues that really require more scrutiny before we really know what's up. And people are working on that as well they should. Um, a big claim, though, that has been thrown around since the first images came back from JWST, from the James Webb Space Telescope, is people have made a big deal out of, oh, wow, look, all of these big, bright, massive early galaxies are out there and we didn't think we should see them. And therefore, you put that with the Hubble tension and now we've got a big crisis. And that was really unfortunate. Because to me, you know, I want to be careful about things. I want to be circumspect, making sure I understand what I'm looking at. And you can't always do that with the very first batch of data you get back from a new observatory. It turned out one of the reasons we're seeing galaxies that look bigger and brighter than we expected is JWST is overperforming. It's performing better than it was designed to perform. And part of the reason for that is it's not just the largest, biggest, most sophisticated, most advanced space telescope we've ever sent up. It's also the cleanest space telescope we've ever kept up. If you've seen those photos of the technicians in the white suits in the big clean room at NASA, that's what all of that is. They managed to create better vacuum systems. They developed a new type of carbon dioxide snow to clean the mirrors in case any dust or dirt or oils got on them. And James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, wound up being the cleanest telescope we've ever launched. So without dust on its mirrors, without dirt, without debris, the images it's returning are sharper and more efficient than we had anticipated. And so part of, oh, look how big and bright those galaxies are, is actually, oh, well, we didn't realize that the telescope is actually overperforming. So what we see as brighter isn't because the galaxy itself is brighter back in the distant past, it's because the telescope is better, so we see it brighter. Another thing that happened is we said, oh, well, we're basing what we expect to see on all of these simulations. And there's a problem with simulations. What we're talking about is we're looking at cosmic scales with billions of solar masses that have collected together. But we're talking about stuff that's being assembled out of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and whatever dark matter is. Those mass scales are different by like 60, 70 orders of magnitude. You can't simulate that. So we have a problem with resolution in our simulations. 
And what we discovered is that, yeah, if you run these medium resolution simulations to the best of your ability, you're not going to pick out the densest regions and you're not going to see how they grew with respect to the cosmic background density in the detail that you need. But in March of this year, a grad student named Joe McCaffrey put out a paper with his collaborators where he showed, look, if you use this older high resolution simulation called the Renaissance simulation, which has been around since 2013 to 2015 was when it was refined, um, then all of a sudden you say, hey, look at the densest areas. Look at these rare fluctuations that exist but that you have to hone in on. If you hone in on them, then all of a sudden you say, oh, well, we actually expect these big bright galaxies to be there and to appear before the universe is even 200 million years old since the hot big bang. So, you know, all of those early claims of, oh my God, how did those galaxies get so big so fast? They didn't look at the highest resolution simulations. And when you do, that problem goes away. And I think that's really important. It's very easy, just like it was 15 years ago when we had the whole faster than light neutrinos fiasco, if you remember that. You have to make sure that what you're claiming is a big deal actually holds up to the full scientific scrutiny you need to give it. The big bright early galaxies, yeah. JWST is seeing big, bright, early galaxies, but are they too big and too bright and too early for the standard model of cosmology? I don't think they are, and most people in the field don't think there are. This is going to be a continued topic of conversation, but you have to look at the data and what it tells you in as gory detail as possible in order to really suss out what is it that's going on. I mean... Like there is all of this evidence that is stacked up on on the one side of this, and now JWST is has joined the fray, and of course it is peering into the places that we never were able to see up until this point, and of course it's going to discover things that were that were unexpected. But as a science communicator that is attempting to navigate this stuff, this is where I look to folks like you and and. Brian Koberline and and uh, Paul Sutter and and such to have a more even keeled approach to this. And, you know, I'm unable to navigate it, but my experience tells me that your perspective and their perspective is t plays out over time. As Paul S Sutter says, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. Um, <laughs> and and that over time, as we sort of start to gather more evidence as as the 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 most interesting stuff is is you know looked at we come to a much better understanding of, of what's going on but it is really tricky because of the how the internet works so fast people are making all kinds of videos there's all kinds of stuff on youtube there's lots of websites that maybe are quicker to report this stuff than maybe we are at universe today um do you think that that sort of modern science communication is is ready for for the way these things are playing out so quickly? Well, there's a challenge here, right? When you talk about modern science communication, I'm someone who's keenly aware of, oh, OK, I read this thing. It was completely untrue. It really annoyed me. And I had to write a debunker piece about it. Um that used to be a thing when I was doing my science writing, you know, 10 years ago, where maybe, you know, a handful of times a year, a claim would get out and I'd have to say like, whoa, 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 hold your horses, everyone. Like, let's look at this in detail, see what the evidence says, because there are some big claims being made here. And does, does the evidence come in enough that, you know, this can be a check that someone's mouth is running that the evidence's butt can cash or not? Um, and now, you know, we're only two thirds of the way through the year and I've already had to do this 15 or 16 times this year. So, you know, as far as is the internet ready for it? Is science communication ready for it? I mean, 
Science communication is unfortunately just like a lot of the internet, journalism, communication in general, uh, the system is being flooded with noise. And there are plenty of noisemakers out there who are making more noise than I am. And my solution isn't like, well, I need to go make more noise by myself is like, no, let me just sit here, do what I do carefully, scrupulously, looking at the full suite of evidence, talking to the people who I need to talk to about this and, and putting things in context of what we know and what we'd like to answer. Because it's very easy to go to a PR department and say, make me famous, get me in the newspapers, get me in the New York Times, get me in the media, get me on Joe Rogan, get me, get me in my claims to the point where people are paying attention to them. And my goal isn't for you to pay attention. My goal is for you to, to get it right. My goal is for you to be correctly informed, and that's slow, and that takes time. People have been saying for a hundred years that a lie flies around the world, around the entire world, before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. And as a non-pants wearer, um, I, I don't even know how to say, you know, even that doesn't save me enough time. It's still slow. Getting the truth out is slow, but it's worth it because you don't want to be misinformed. I'm assuming that none of your listeners, none of your readers, none of your viewers want to be misinformed. They want the correct information, even if it's a sober take that doesn't, you know, fire the imagination like crisis, revolution, everything's going to be overturned. Everything you thought you knew is wrong. The universe is double the age we thought, and we don't know what matter is at all. Like, no, it's not that bad. Like, our foundations of knowledge are more solid than they've ever been. A lot of people point to the past and say, well, we thought we knew everything back in 1500 when we had the geocentric model. And we thought we knew everything again in 1900 when we had Newtonian gravity and Maxwell's electromagnetism. And look at how naive we were and look at how much more we've learned. And although that's true, the state of knowledge today, the state of scientific knowledge, this body of facts that we've accumulated over the history of human civilization has grown more by much more than almost anyone appreciates in the last 120 years than it did in the million years before that. So have some appreciation for how far we've come. It may yet turn out that something is wrong with the standard model of cosmology, but the evidence we have today gives no indication that any of the wild ideas that are being floated are better at describing the universe than standard Lambda CDM cosmology. Do people misunderstand how skeptical and confrontational scientists are with each other? You know, they do underestimate that when they're listening to scientists who aren't their own worst skeptics. We don't talk about it very much, but part of the training that goes into being a scientist is knowing how to be skeptical of your own work, of your own results, how to be your own worst critic, so that before a paper ever gets out of your internal collaboration and ever gets to the desk of a referee or editor or peer reviewer, you've done your best to poke every hole you can poke in your own work and seal that up. As scientists, it's up to us to steel man our own arguments, is to make them as strong as possible against criticism. Because once it gets out in the world, there are only a few people who are capable of doing that in-depth analysis to really scrutinize, have you done everything properly? If you see a scientist who's acting like it's the wild, wild west, and I can do whatever I want and make whatever inferences I want and publish whatever I want, that's a bad model for being a scientist. That's how you do sloppy work. That's how you get misinformation widespread out there. We just saw that with the LK99 superconductor claim. You see it with anything about anyone who claims they've found alien technology here on Earth. You see it 
you know, widespread universes double its age, dark matter doesn't exist, it's been falsified, right? All of these wild claims that no one in the field believes, that everyone in the field looks at and says, oh, you were careless. You were overly optimistic about your own data, your own analysis, your own ideas, and you didn't look at the broader picture. You didn't look at the full suite of evidence and what it all implies. And so for me, I, I'm i in that lucky position where I get to bring my own expertise and I also know how to ask people, hey, this isn't my area of expertise. I need more expertise and you have it. Tell me about it. Tell me about the background here. Tell me about what this looks like. Show me the papers that provide the backing evidence for it and let me read through them because that information exists. You know, we are not doing this for the very first time. It's not like we're we're trying to figure out the mystery of, oh, when I light a candle, uh, does the wax use up the phlogiston? that's around it? Or does does the flame some aspect of this combining with something that's in the atmosphere until it's all gone, right? We, we know about atoms and molecules and chemical reactions and the, the particles that underlie them and how those reactions take place. We know how to build the universe from fundamental particles up to atoms, molecules, macroscopic things to planets, to stars, to galaxies, to black holes, to the large scale structure of the universe. We have a really comprehensive picture of how things work. And if you're going to say, well, I'm going to throw it all away, you better come up with something that's at least as successful as that old theory was. And you have to explain some new things. That's really difficult to do. It's part of the reason why so many of our best theories are really unchallenged. Because most of the challengers to them, you could say like, well, what about modified Newtonian dynamics instead of dark matter? Well, you do that. And you can't even reproduce all the successes of dark matter without including dark matter. So... I would say you have to reach that step. You want to throw away lambda CDM. You want to throw away dark energy. You can't explain how the universe is expanding without dark energy, with or without the Hubble tension. The Hubble tension is a much smaller effect than the overwhelming effect of dark energy. Uh, these are not things you could just wave your hands and poof and make them go away with some sort of movie magic. This is... This is our universe and what it tells us it is, right? That's the way you do science is you ask the universe a question about itself in the right way, whether it's via experiment or measurement or observation, you ask it a key question, you go out and you make the key measurement. And if you've asked it properly and you've measured it properly, you're going to get an answer that it can escape from. And even if you don't like what that answer is telling you, this is the story the universe tells it about itself. We were smart enough to ask it the right questions. We'd better listen very carefully to what it's telling us. But let's say if a third of the articles that you write now are debunking various claims that are overreaching and say a third are lighthearted uh answers to people's questions, I would say another third, and you wrote a whole book about cool Star Trek technology, is that you like to think about the stuff that's right at the very edge and the limits of, of what we understand and what we know. And, and those are the kinds of stories that I'm interested in too, you know, like my favorite kind of story for us to cover on Universe Today is when somebody has come up with a really clever idea to solve a, an outstanding problem in physics or to you know send a spacecraft to neptune or or whatever and and i think that we want that kind of thinking where it is more speculative and it's not someone's not saying like this has been discovered but like here's a really great idea how can we sort of keep our minds open at the same time that we can be rigorous in our scientific thinking Right. So this is this is a very good question because this is a very deep question, right? You want to bring people up to the frontiers, 
right? Bring them up to the legitimate frontiers where you say, here's what we know, and here's that limit. And you want to peer over that horizon and kind of look and what, what could we be looking at next? How do we get there? How do we discover what's next? What are some ideas? If this is what's next, how, how do we discover it? Right. So so this is a huge thing is to be forward looking from the frontiers. And how do we get there? There's a huge reason that there was so much excitement about JWST for so many years before it was launched. Right. We know looking back now how revolutionary the Hubble Space Telescope was, how much it taught us about this is what the universe looks like. This is what planet forming and star forming systems look like. This is what the planets look like. This is what those nebulae in space look like. This is what galaxies look like as far as Hubble's capable of seeing, right? It was tremendous. It truly has shown us this is what your universe looks like. What a lot of people don't appreciate is JWST is that next giant leap to say, we know what the universe looks like now. Now we're going to see it in greater detail in wavelengths of light we've never probed before, which makes us sensitive to features we haven't been sensitive to before. And we're going to see back earlier and earlier in cosmic history than ever before. This was not an accident. This was by design. Now it's happening. We're living in this era now. And, you know, people are still sort of trying to catch up with, well, well, what what do we know? What have we seen? What What is the farthest galaxy? How deep have we looked back? What have we learned about the very early universe? Science doesn't progress all at once where it's like, ah, we found this thing and now we used to think that way, but now we all think this way. There are very few discoveries that work that way. Uh, this is really truly taking an entire community, thousands of astronomers and astrophysicists all working on their own little, little, you know, minuscule part of the cosmic puzzle. And we have to synthesize it all together to sort of see how have things changed? What has this taught us? What, what refinements did we need to make? What things were we able to ignore previously that now we're compelled to include? And what oversights did we, we didn't think that was important, but nature is showing us, no, this really is important. This is huge. It affects everything from stars to galaxies to black holes to the environment around galaxies. We're learning where do you make planets? How rich, how enriched does your stellar material have to be so that it can form rocky planets? What does this mean for the chances of life in the universe or in our own galaxy or in our own cosmic backyard? Do we have a chance at detecting it? I do think it's important to look to that next cosmic horizon because there are some huge discoveries that I fully anticipate are going to occur in the next decade or two. I anticipate that with Habitable Worlds Observatory, that's not NASA's next flagship mission. That one's called the Nancy Grace Roman Observatory, but the one after that, Habitable Worlds Observatory, that should find our first inhabited planet in a solar system beyond our own. That was like today, the, the news of, the, of them bringing together the band again to, to start <laughs> thinking about the, the habitable worlds. They, I got the call, we got there the call was today. a workshop at Space Telescope Science Institute earlier this year, and I was only able to attend virtually, but that's, that's what everyone was focused yeah. on because the, the science you can do with that is tremendous. It, it's basically like, imagine James Webb Space Telescope, but not optimized for the infrared, optimized for the optical. And imagine what you could see if you looked at a system that was analogous to our own solar system with their coronagraph technology, the largeness of their primary mirror that they're anticipating, the type of optical corrections they're imagining doing, and the way they'll be able to block out light from the parent star, they're estimating that they can measure the atmospheric contents of anywhere between about a dozen and several scores of Earth-like 
or I should say Earth-sized worlds around roughly sun-like stars. In the habitable That's zone. tremendous. Yeah. What we call the habitable zone today, yeah. Um, so with Earth-like temperatures, assuming they have Earth-like atmosphere, with the potential for thin atmospheres and liquid water on their surface that is sustained over the long term, with the right abundances of heavy elements that interesting chemical reactions are possible, we might get to answer the question, how often does life arise from non-life on planets like this? How often does life sustain itself and saturate the surface to sort of, you know, regulate the atmospheres, the oceans and temperatures and chemistry and things like that, right? These, these are questions that are entirely theoretical today that are going to become observational in the very near future. On the gravitational wave front, less than 10 years ago, we never directly detected a gravitational wave. Now, we not only have them from merging and inspiraling black holes and neutron stars, but we've detected the cumulative signal from all of the massive black hole binaries out there collectively in the universe. It's only a matter of time, I would bet, within the next decade we've got it, before we detect the first ultra-massive black hole binaries, supermassive black holes that are orbiting one another that are locked in this inevitable death spiral where eventually they're in, they will in-spiral and merge together. It's only a matter of time before we detect individual systems and say, right over there, uh, 400 million years from now, those two black holes are going to merge together. Um, this is incredible when you look at what are the frontiers of science, what's over that horizon, because it's not just like, oh, here are some great questions we want answers to. We're actually making plans now to improve our current technologies and develop new ones where we'll be able to answer these questions within our lifetimes. And what are some of the, you know, you talked about some of these observations that we could make and, you know, either way the habitable worlds mission goes, whether we find something or don't find something, both answer is, you know, in the words of Arthur C. Clarke, equally terrifying. Um, what are some of the mysteries that we have been chewing on for a long time that you feel like we finally have the the tools in place, I think, or or coming within the next say decade that that we have been kind of going like what is that we don't know but now finally sort of humanity has brought the right tools to the to the project one of the things that i think is really interesting is about dark matter a lot of people think oh dark matter is just some naive diffuse fuzzy thing that's out there through the science of gravitational lensing which is what occurs when you're looking out at a distant object and in between your line of sight to that object, there's another mass intervening. That intervening mass is going to distort and magnify the light from the background object. But everything is very sensitive to the lens geometry. If you just had one big fluffy diffuse halo of dark matter, you would get a specific signal that is different than the signals we observe. We find strong evidence, and this is again only pretty recent, we finding very strong evidence that in these big clusters of galaxies, there are these tiny little clumps of dark matter moving within the halo. We call this halo substructure or dark matter substructure. We can't explain our observations without it. I think what this means as we advance further and further with better te telescope technology, better imaging of lensed systems, and a better quantification of both weak and strong gravitational lensing, that we're likely going to be able pretty soon to sort of say, hey, when you have a dark matter halo in general, this is the type and clumpiness of substructure within it and here's how you can detect it. Just as we know, when we look at a galaxy, we're actually seeing hundreds of billions of stars together 
their light together distributed over this dusty galaxy, we're going to be able to say when we look at a gravitationally lens system like, well, yeah, here's the dark matter, but here's the complicated structure inside this dark matter halo. Uh, that's an advance that I don't think a lot of people appreciate is really going to be profound in terms of teaching us what dark matter astrophysically can and cannot be as far as its nature is concerned. Right. So that gives us almost like we're seeing the resolution of the dark matter. We're seeing how small it likes to break itself into as pieces as they're hovering around some galaxy cluster. Again, to the limits of our observations, right. yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is this great trinity of projects coming online. There's the Euclid mission that's already launched. There's Nancy Grace Roman, mm -hmm. which is coming in 27. There's Vera Rubin, which comes online next year at some point, and first light maybe 25, 24, 25. They should do a lot of the heavy lifting to help us figure out dark matter, dark energy, or at least put constraints on them. Well, these three missions, they all have something in common that I'll be honest, we don't have anything like them today, which is they are all capable of not only viewing the universe in high resolution, we, we have things that can do that, but they're all capable of viewing large areas of the sky in these high resolutions. So we're going to be able to map out large sections of the universe like never before. We're going to have huge areas that we can observe looking for faint transient events like supernovae. We're going to have all of these gravitationally lens systems that we just serendipitously discover because we're looking at large areas of the sky. And you're right from a variety of different methods, because whenever you look at a little patch of sky, you're seeing the stuff that's close, the stuff at intermediate distances, the stuff that's very far away, right? All of it is contained in that same region of sky. So outfitted with the right instruments, which Euclid, uh, Roman and Rubin all are, we're going to be able to say, oh, wow, look, before I was able with this much data to put, you know, oh, dark energy behaves like a cosmological constant plus or minus 7%. We're going to get that down to like plus or minus 1%. We're really going to narrow our uncertainties down, which is interesting because it means maybe dark energy isn't a cosmological constant. Maybe there's some way it either evolves with time, strengthening or weakening. Maybe it actually uh, will dilute a little bit or strengthen a little bit as the universe continues to expand. There are going to be things we have the potential to discover. And that's a concept that I think a lot of non-scientists don't really understand is when we build new observatories or in particle physics, when we build new colliders or anything in science where we sort of push the frontier of what we have access to, of what we can explore, we open up what we call new discovery space, which is saying we're looking at the universe as we've never looked at it before. If some sort of new phenomenon, physics, particle, field is out there, what do we have the potential to discover? And this is where most people in science, I, I feel, this is where most people in science get the most excited. Because if you don't venture to explore the universe in a new way, with new tools, new techniques, unprecedented power in some way, you're never going to find anything new. You're just going to tread all over that same old ground over and over again. Look in, the, in a new way. Look with new tools. Look with more power. Because what you could discover could truly be that revolution you're really seeking, that revolution you're caring about, the, the, the greater distance you can look to, the, the higher energy you can probe the universe at, the, the lower the temperature you can cool your condensed matter systems down to, this is where discoveries are waiting to be made. And I feel like 
the less we invest in that as a civilization, the more people screaming fire and boys crying wolf and smoke and mirrors we're going to be susceptible to. Because when we don't have the real science there to fuel our imaginations, we, we make it up. We make it up for ourselves. And I don't want to see that happen. Science is, to me, the most beautiful, powerful endeavor humanity has ever engaged in. If you want a better society, have that society invest more in science, in basic, fundamental scientific research. Because when you discover that new advance, it can blow everything else you found out of the water. Think about how many systems we have today rely on electricity that we didn't even know about 200 years ago. Think about how many devices we have today, like your smartphone, that rely on quantum technologies that we didn't even know about 100 years ago, right? Imagine what the future can be if we make those big next breakthroughs. We don't know unless we look. If we want to discover something profound and something new, we have to look. Those three observatories you just mentioned, Euclid, Roman, and Rubin, they're three of many observatories that are in development. In the Southern Hemisphere, we have the ELT and the GMT that are under construction. These are going to be 30-meter class ground-based telescopes. They're going to have 10 times the light gathering power and more than three times the best current resolution of any observatory we have from the ground. What can you find when you look at the universe with better eyes than you've ever had before? I don't know. Let's find out, right? <laughs> well, we can't do that for our telescopes, but we can do that by building new ones. So let's build them because there's a whole universe still out there to discover, and I won't be satisfied until we know it all. The, these discoveries sort of require an interesting balance between the theorists and the experimenters. The people building the telescopes I sort of see as the experimenters in this situation with astronomy because you can't, you know, you can't run the universe multiple times and see which, which way things turn out. Right. It's not, it's not a laboratory you control. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a laboratory you can only look at. Although, you know, like the archaeologists would love to be able to like look through a telescope and see ancient civilizations sort of at the edge of their their viewing. So they have a lot of advantages over other sciences as well. Um, but do you think we get the balance right between the work that the theorists do and the work that the experimenters do? You know, it really is a partnership. But is, is one side of this sort of um, sort of overtaking the other, do you think? You know, this is a tough question because I, as a theorist, that's what I was trained as, yep. um, you know, I, I have a special place in my heart for the synthesis aspect of it, for, you know, saying, well, we need to broaden ourselves and look at this full suite of evidence and make sense of it. And that's the job of a theorist. And also part of the job of a theorist is to say, well, we haven't observed this yet, but if this thing should be out there, what do we predict it's going to be? So what should you go out and look for? I think that when theory and experiment are closely intertwined, that's when a really good advance can occur. When observers or experimentalists are probing things that have a chance to test what theorists are predicting. Do you find it? Do you not find it? Do you find more or fewer? Do you find more or less, right? It's a quantitative endeavor. So what are you looking for? How big do you predict the signal should be? Where do you expect to see it? What does it mean if it's larger or smaller? These are all questions that I think exist very powerfully at the nexus of theory and experiment or theory and observation. I think things get into very sketchy territory when theorists get bored because the current experiments that are going on aren't exposing anything new. If you just see the same things over and over again, right, you get really bored going, yeah, 
Standard model of cosmology, victorious again. Einstein's general relativity, victorious again. Great, right? You want to see those cracks. You want to see that potential for a revolutionary new discovery. But we can't allow ourselves to be driven by wishful thinking. The, the most immediate advances have to come out of, look, here's my way as a theorist of putting things together in a way that makes sense. If I put them together in this alternate way, what would I expect? Can I rule this out? And if so, how? If I have a consensus theory and I have a rival theory that I've developed it, I need my rival theory. I've got to do three things. I've got to match and reproduce all of the current successes. I've got to explain things that the current theory can explain. And then I have to go and make some new predictions about something I have not yet measured where my predictions differ from the predictions of the old theory. And then we can go out and look for that. The whole three step of I want to reproduce the old successes I want to explain things that can't be explained under the current paradigm, and I want to make new predictions that we can test against the old theory. That's how theoretical advances, that's how scientific revolutions actually occur. That's how Einstein's general relativity replaced Newtonian gravity. That's how quantum field theory encompassed and superseded the old quantum mechanics. And that's how we got stuck or advanced to learn our universe contains dark matter, dark energy, and this inflationary phrase, sorry, this inflationary phase that preceded and set up the hot big bang is because you, you went and scrupulously made sure I have to reproduce all the old successes. I have to explain these things that my old theory is either wrong or agnostic about. And I have to make new predictions that we can go out and measure and look for them and then determine is the new theory right or was the old theory right or some third option, right? That's how you advance. And so I think theory and experiment or theory and observation work best together when they play with each other. When they stop talking to each other, when theorists go off and do their own thing and are disconnected from observables or measurables, I think that's when you get into the hot water of speculative territory that you can't validate or falsify. Do you think there are ways to iterate the process a little faster? I mean, I think, you know, my my degree is in computer science. My background is in running technical projects. And the faster we iterate the more we are able to take our throw our assumptions out the more we're able to to make discoveries in the in the projects that we're we're working on you know when you have this really long lead time from when the idea has been thought of and then 25 years later the telescope finally launches you've got a lot of theorists that that set down their ideas and now they're waiting for the tool to prove them right and yet it takes big in some cases you know big iron to to make these kinds of discoveries. How could we sort of speed up the process to allow that communication to happen and to iterate in a way that maybe neither side can kind of get away from the other, do you think? I mean, the that's a very tough question, right? Because first off, it's really worth pointing out, I don't think a lot of people realize this, there are many more scientists who are observers or experimentalists than there are theorists. Uh, theorists are always going to be data hungry. Experimentalists are always going to be data hungry. Theorists are always going to be creative about, ooh, theory could mean this. Experimentalists are going to care a lot less about that unless what you're talking about theoretically is experimentally testable. It's when you can test it, when you can put it to those critical tests that experimentalists get interested in theory. If you give me some untestable hypothesis and I'm an experimentalist, I'm going to go, good for you. I'm going to get back to my work here. If you give me something where you say, hey, uh, have you seen any neutron stars that have merged together and made another stable neutron star after doing that? 
uh, I would say, oh, that's a good question. Let me go see. Oh, no, we haven't seen one of those yet. What would it take? All right, well, here's our prospects for seeing that, and here's what tools we would like. And you know, when LIGO Japan, or sorry, when Kagra and LIGO India come online, our enhanced sensitivity with five ground-based gravitational wave telescopes might really help us hone in on those, right? So I think you can say, well, look, you can either blanket say, well, we should always be investing in what's next in science, and we should never leave that pipeline empty so that we can reduce the gaps between, oh, geez, we had Hubble, and then we did what for how many years? And then it took another 30-something years before we got JWST. I, I don't think that's a smart way to look at things, right? JWST was not right after Hubble. We had a lot of important things happen. And we also had a lot of uh, lessons we needed to learn, I think, as a community and also as, as the enterprise of human civilization to say, boy, when we don't invest in this, um, we really stagnate, right? We could have had a super, sorry, we could have had a superconducting super collider that was more powerful than the LHC is now decades ago, except, you know, we, we chose not to build it. We got partway through. We said, ah, it's going to be too expensive. And what are we going to learn anyway? And now that kind of high energy experimental, experimental particle physics, it's dead in the United States. The only place you can do it is at CERN in France and Switzerland. Um, because, the main ring at Fermilab, which up until it shut down about 11 years ago, it was the second most powerful particle accelerator in the world. And in the face of the LHC, it just does, won't teach us anything new that the LHC can teach us better. So, you know, this is it. If we want to be at the forefront of science and technology and development, you have to keep investing in it. It, it has the highest consistent return on investment of any investment we can make as a nation, but that isn't going to necessarily convince everyone to do it. Um, you know, that has to be something that I think personally should be independent of temporary political will, which is very fickle. Uh, part of the reason James Webb Space Telescope exists at all is because it survived a whole bunch of various funding cycles where various politicians wanted to kill it. They wanted to kill it during the Bush years. They wanted to kill it during the Obama years. They wanted to kill it during the Trump years, right? There are always people who are going to say, oh, you don't need that. Oh, that's not essential. But I think, look, if you're talking about reducing, oh, well, it takes time for observers and experimentalists to collect their data and analyze it properly, there are a few computational things you can automate, and that's why I would say there's been a huge development of AI and machine learning tools for the large data sets that come in in astronomy and physics, and that's useful. But at some point, you really do need human eyes with human expertise analyzing this data, teasing out the signals, analyzing it in a robust way, um, so that you can sort of compare it to your theories, right? There's There are some things that computationally you can do, um, but that delay isn't the big problem. The big problem is we don't have a robust pipeline with guaranteed funding for these projects to happen. We run the risk of really with everything we do that, that we could have the rug pulled out from us at any moment in time. And theorists are not going to advance if the data isn't coming in from the experimental and observational side. We're going to stagnate too. Um, so I think it is really a rising tide lifts all boats sort of situation where if you're a theorist, you should be cheering for the experimentalists. And I won't say you should be hoping for what they should find, but you should always be advocating for, hey, when there's discovery space out there within reach, go for it. Because if you go for it, regardless of what you find, whether it's more of what we expected or some small surprises that we had to tweak some things in the model or some big surprises that are still puzzles we can't explain, 
taking that step, finding that stuff helps you go to the next step. And unless you keep taking steps, you're never going to reach that next big breakthrough, whatever it may be. Are we going to go through this process that we went through with JWST? Like when Vera Rubin comes online and they are dumping out petabytes of data onto the internet and it is turning up thousands of supernovae a month and all kinds of crazy things. Do you think we're going to have a kind of, I like that. Yeah, I know it's, it's, uh, someone said like, (laughs) like we know of like 1500 type 20 supernovae and Vera Rubin's expected to find millions in its primary observing run. Well, you do have to remember, we're talking about a telescope that's as powerful as the Hubble Space Telescope. And to date, the Hubble Space Telescope is our best Type 1a supernova finder and observer of all, right? We're talking about a telescope that's the same power as Hubble, but has a field of view that's about 50 to 100 times wider. So if you said, okay, here's what Hubble can find in 30 years, you can say, okay, well, Vera Rubin is going to find that same amount of stuff that Hubble found in 30 years in about four months. It's incredible, right? It's incredible. So when you're when you're talking about this, like, yeah, uh, we are going to get so much data. But we are absolutely going to have to go through the, oh, well, this is the first data we're getting with this telescope. So how does it compare, right? There's one of the worst things you can do in any science is to rush off and draw fast conclusions with your data before your data has been properly calibrated. Now, we've done some amazing things with JWST. But understanding how the telescope is performing is not something you can do during six months of commissioning. You need large amounts of data that have come in, been analyzed, and compared to all of the other things you've ever looked at, the same objects, uh, all the other telescopes you've looked at the same objects with. You need to know what you're looking at and what corrections to apply, or you're going to have miscalibrated data. So that's still going to be a danger with uh, Vera Rubin, with any new observatory. And that is part of why you need a broad and healthy scientific community that is aware of not only all the issues that have come up in the past, but is savvy enough that when a new issue that comes up with this new observatory, this new technology, this new instrument that you've never had before, that they're able to identify it and figure out how to accurately and precisely account for any way that it's different than what your naive expectation might have been. Because most of the things you would look at in science where you say, oh my, I didn't get the answer that I expected to get, there's a reason behind it. And the reason isn't because everything we know about the universe is wrong. The reason is, oh, there's an explanation because this instrument under these conditions operates in this way, and this is its throughput, and this is its efficiency, and this is its point spread function, and we didn't know that until we got enough data in and down and analyzed to draw those conclusions. Yeah, I I feel like we're going to go through the whole thing again, which is fine. I'm up for it. You know, this is our job (laughs) as science communicators is to is to help clear the stuff up for people. But I know we're going to go through another round of uh, everything we thought we knew about the universe was wrong. You know, yeah. uh, listen, just because there are always going to be boys who cry wolf doesn't mean we shouldn't have a wolf alert system. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm I am so excited um, about that and about all this stuff. I mean, I I really feel like we're living in the golden age of astronomy and and I can't go a few minutes without stumbling over another fascinating, interesting discovery that's that's happening. Uh, even it's been an absolute pleasure to to talk to you again. And I, you know, seriously, I 
you know, I do see you as a mentor. I know we don't, we don't, we don't spend all the time on the mentoring process, but I read everything you write. <laughs> and I, and I think about all the times you have you spend slapped. a lot of time reading. I, I, I think a lot <laughs> about the times you've slapped my wrist when we got it wrong. And we do take that to heart. And it has definitely guided the direction that Universe Today has taken over the years. So, you know, whether you know that well, you're playing that role or not. That's a very high compliment from the first person who ever called me a cosmic buzzkill. <laughs> uh, to know that the information I'm providing is actually useful and appreciated. Uh, because I know... I know it can be frustrating to hear like, okay, like Did some people said this thing. Some people said this thing, but I don't think it's true. And here's yeah, why. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think you helped me fine tune my bullshit detector. Uh, at, <laughs> like the Carl Sagan baloney detector. Uh, you helped me and you and, and as I said, Brian Coberline, who's one of the writers at Universe Today and Dr. Paul Sutter and others who, because, you know, I'm not a cosmologist. But my job is to be here and help the cosmologists and the scientists communicate their work, but to not get sucked into the stuff that is beyond my pay grade to recognize what I what I know and what I don't know, and to be very careful and tentative when it when it's starting to set off those those sensors. And I think right. early well, on you're 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 doing really good if you recognize like, hmm, claims of the standard model is falsified yeah, yeah. or this pillar of science has a crack in it and is gonna fall over, or, you know, everything we know is wrong, right? Those those should set you off. But it's it's a lot more complicated when issues like fraud or exaggeration plus ego or just some chicanery is going on uh it's very difficult to do that so you know as always if you're if you run into something and you want my expert take on it feel free to yeah. ask and i'll always do my best to say look like it's important we get the correct information out there to people and i'm going to do my best to give you that and your constructive feedback is always welcome so we well, don't take it personally. Uh, we just use it to well, get thank better. you very much. And yeah. one thing I'm finally allowed to talk about, if it's okay, if I talk yeah, about well, it. Yeah, I want to get into the shameless is, self-promotion phase of this of this episode. So tell, what, are you, what are you working oh, on? Well, so I have recently completed a few exciting things. Uh, I finished my first children's book this year called The Littlest Girl Goes Inside an Atom which I co-wrote with Laura Menenti, who is a mother of three, and as a particle physicist was very disappointed that there are no good books about the physics of the very small out there for children. Um, and so we went and wrote a wonderful story, and it's been beautifully illustrated, and it's now been published, um, and I'm really proud of it. Another project that I've just finished uh, is the Encyclopedia Cosmologica, which is a wonderful telling of the history of the universe, where each time you open it, uh, every page will have a brief set of stats about what was in the universe at that epoch, at that time period, uh, in terms of planets, stars, ha habitable worlds, the temperature of the universe, etc., and a story about what's happening somewhere in the universe on one side. And then on the other side, we have a unique art spread that was created by either Mark Garlick or John Lomberg, who for me are two wonderful and legendary space artists. Uh, in fact, John, some of you out there may know, worked on the Voyager Golden Record for 1977 and was the art director for Carl Sagan's original television series Cosmos. So getting to work with him was like a lifelong dream come true in a way for me. Um, and that's just been finished. So I've written the book, Mark and John have illustrated it, and Will Lidwell has designed it. And this was his brainchild. He's a uh, designer. Um, and I think it's coming out wonderfully. Um, that'll be available holiday season this year. Uh, but I'm working on a new book also uh, in partnership with National Geographic. We are putting together a book about 
JWST, a book about the James Webb Space Telescope from its development and assembly to its launch and deployment to the sites and the science that we're seeing in now its first year plus of operation. Uh, and I'm writing that right now. In fact, I was working on it earlier today, uh, and it should be published next year uh, where you should be able to get your hands on it. So exciting times for me. And just as just as all of you are excited by all of these things, I'm I can't imagine I'm less excited than any of you. I think this is this is the story of the universe, what it's telling us about itself. And I just get to be the translator from astrophysics into English. Wonderful. Well, Ethan, always a pleasure. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you sign up for his blog at, at Big Think. You've got a podcast that you're doing. You, you're you clearly getting set up. So at some point, we'll see you on YouTube, hopefully. Um, oh, I, I think it won't be too long. All right, we're ready. <laughs> all right, we'll let us know when you come live. Again, always a pleasure. Thanks for all your help. And uh, I look forward to everything you're working on. Thank you so much, Frazier. Keep at it and keep Universe Today uh, keeping us all informed. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Mark Anstis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Just Paul Davis, Vlad Shiplin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonad, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Veriboff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.